Welcome to the Lojo Show. Thank you for joining us. We are habitually complacent. My baloney has a second name. It's M A Y E R. What? There's always a persistent threat. There is no monopoly on good ideas when it comes to cybersecurity. Welcome to the Lojo Show. I'm here today with Yuri from SharePass. I'm going to introduce him and let him tell you a little bit about himself. I just want to say I'm excited about this episode, guys. When we look at cyber and the overall landscape right now, just globally, right? Yuri over in Australia. Globally, we all face a lot of the same problems, issues, concerns, as well as the same life cycle as we look at how our world is evolving with uh, cloud management, work from home as well from that, uh, and then also even having a global workforce and uh, being able to look and go through some of the solutions and ideas and with Yuri here about SharePass. I'm excited to go about this today, just hear his perspective on this and also about a lot more about his company too. Thank you. It's great to be here. Nice to meet you. And I'm the CEO of SharePass. We provide the you know, cybersecurity communication platform where we allow users to secure their data uh, in transmission and essentially control the digital footprint. Tell me a little bit about, about, about the digital footprint, Yuri. When we talk about that, just to get the listeners engaged in this, digital footprint, how do you guys define that? So digital footprint essentially for us is everything that you do online, every activity, and you leave some traces behind you is digital footprint. And that means any information you put online on your social media, you share with clients, you share with your friends, with your family, anything you put in digital in writing is your digital footprint, essentially. Let's say, for example, I'm sending you something confidential over the email. So that document, for example, then stays on your email. Uh, so it leaves a trace. So if that email, for example, later on gets breached, hacked, falls into the wrong hands, then this information is quite easily discoverable. Uh, and we are in that market to reduce the digital footprint, maybe to eliminate, but that really depends on the user. And really to protect uh, whoever uses the SharePass platform, because one of the main problems today with cybersecurity is still about 70% of breaches are as a result of mishandled credentials. That's like low-hanging fruit. And uh, we're trying to provide a solution which will reduce that amount. Excellent. And so with that, tell us about the founding of your company and how you guys identified this as a particular area that you wanted to, to solve or to begin to address within the marketplace. Sure. So I'm in my background. Originally, I'm a system administrator and I've started a business uh, about 13 years ago in Melbourne, Australia, uh, where we provide IT solutions, IT consulting services, cloud services and so forth. As part of our daily job, we, I, we identified a challenge where how do we share confidential data with our clients? And it was always a bit of a problem because not everybody used password managers. So people used to share confidential stuff over email, SMS, chat, and those sort of tools. And we always felt a little bit unsure about that because sometimes users ask password and you don't really want to send it over SMS because you never know how they protect their phone. So later on, if they leave their phone, for example, unlocked without any pin code, and many people do that these days, then this, then those credentials are then discoverable to anyone in clear text. And that creates a potential for cybersecurity breach. As a result, we started, uh, me and my other two co-founders, their names is Mauro and Luciano. We started working on the solution and we came out with an MVP and that kind of really worked for us. So we started using it with our clients. And then slowly we looked at it and we said, we use it with our clients. We're pretty sure other clients can use it too. And then we just decided to run it as a separate business. And basically we are now here after three years, still running. Awesome. Congratulations on that. Congratulations. Yeah. To our listeners, if you're in our DOD or if you're a private, just say just a private user of different cloud services, of software as a service and mail and chats and multiple different ways in which you're providing information. As Yuri was saying, you got a digital footprint. If you think about how you track someone in the woods or track animals in the woods, right? Each one has unique footprints, right? Each one leaves behind certain things, whether it's hair, whether it's a unique footprint as far as how many toes or nails you have, are they extending or not extending? That's what you do every day when you're providing passwords and 
uh, emails and getting access to different uh, uh, media and messages, every day you're leaving a little bit of yourself behind uh, with that. Now, that can be used for good reasons, right? However way you want to define good reasons that we know that we've got multiple definitions of what's good and what's bad that's there. And they can be used for more sinister reasons, whether that is for the theft of your information or confidentiality from that, or in some cases, as well as to see as far as on how they can use you as, a, as an attack platform for your organization or everything else. So these are all important areas here and SharePass has a way as far as beginning to address those. So tell us about the overall services of SharePass. SharePass is available in basically we offer it in two kind of options at the moment. So one is for the consumer and we, we offer it completely free. Uh, so people can go create an account, um, subscribe and just use it for free. It, it has some limitations. And then there is an enterprise platform, which is aimed and geared specifically towards big organizations uh, that look to the next step and to embed it with their own systems, integrate it. And also there is like some added features for the enterprise where it's custom domain, it's dedicated instances, so it depends on the GDPR compliance. For example, if you have a company based in Germany and they might want uh, their own instance uh, in Germany, so we can do that. So SharePass offers essentially an, an app, an online uh, platform for you to really protect your confidential information. And it offers mobile app for both Android and iOS, a browser extension. It's easily available for you to go and encrypt uh, any data that you transmit. And apart from that, we also offer integration services, as I said previously, to enterprises. If a company comes on board and they want to integrate it specifically through their systems, for example, into their CRM, into their any custom systems that they want to integrate SharePass to, we have open API, we support webhooks, and we can offer it to them. Awesome. Now, I think one of the, the, the most complex areas that we have right now is where we have to mix both cybersecurity requirements along with privacy requirements, uh, whether that's be EU or APAC type requirements there. Can you, can you describe how this can help in both addressing, you know, all three of those areas when we talk about um, both, let's say consumer confidentiality, corporate confidentiality from there, and then also compliance with uh, some of those privacy laws and stuff too that are out there too, as far as on how it provides capability to help us in that area. Yeah, thanks for that question. I think that's a very important one. So what happens today in most organizations, a lot using all sorts of online applications. Now, the problem with those online applications, you generally not always aware of where are they hosted? What is the privacy policy? Not necessarily everybody reads it to the full extent. And you, in essence, you lose a little bit of your control over the confidential data that you share. And that might be across multiple channels. So. Take the typical company, they would have uh, email, they would have some form of a chat. Usually, in my, my experience, it would be something like Teams, Microsoft Teams, or and other employees or users, they also would use in, in other chats like WhatsApp and SMS. Even though they're not necessarily always supposed to, they do, they still do. And it happens in majority of cases. And then the picture you get left with is all of your company, all of your users, everybody share confidential data across multiple platforms. And at the end of the day, job is done, right? So everybody do their job. We forgot about what we've done today, but we also forgot about how much digital footprint we left along the way across multiple channels. And that creates a big problem because you can never track that. And then if a breach comes, you sometimes don't even know where it came from because maybe some of those credentials got exposed. And confidential information does not always mean credential. It can mean something like addresses, something that will help whoever is trying to initiate a, a data breach to move one step closer. Uh, so it's what's called uh, social engineering. And what we do is we protect it across multiple channels. So we can, what you, essentially happens is when you use Teams, you can still use Teams, but you can encrypt certain parts of your communication with SharePass. Which then means any data which is transmitted across all of your channels, it's all getting stored in your specific uh, instance of SharePass. If you are a company, call it company X, and that company now takes an, an enterprise SharePass platform, that means they have their own instance hosted in their geographical area. So that basically complied, complied with the GDPR. And any confidential data they transmit in form of SharePass links, 
that data then encrypted gets stored in that database. So it takes all of your credentials, all of your confidentials and everything and stores it in one place where it's protected and encrypted at all times. When we look across a lot of the business cases and stuff that, for instance, we run into a lot, it, it really is about the, you know, the storage of that data, the treatment of that data. And in our case too, most of our legislation is written around how do you bundle and send and encrypt grouped information or information that's been, let's say, classified as, hey, confidential for your organization or uh, something that's sensitive and stuff for that. So being able to have one, uh, the protection of that confidentiality, but two, also being able to hit some of the other areas of non-repudiation and stuff too, of that information is a big goal that each one of the organ each organization has. I'm going to put a scenario in front of you real quick. And if you sure. would just tell me where they're, how some of the, how some of the services, as well as the capabilities of your solutions can help. Um, one of the things that we run into a lot is companies that have, let's say HR departments that have to handle information and files across multiple geographic areas, multiple territories and stuff too, that have different laws and stuff for that. How can SharePass help in that way? A lot of them use HR software and stuff too. Sometimes that HR software does comply, but a lot of these companies already have a huge investment in HR software and they cannot necessarily upgrade to get to the latest version that can do this type of handling. How can SharePass help bridge that gap for them? Yeah. So that's exactly what we want to do. Uh, we want to provide a solution which is easy and available to use with existing systems. We do not want necessarily to come into company and say, all right, from now on, you just use that communication system. And then companies will be very reluctant because uh, they'll be like, okay, we are, but we're already using Teams. And the moment you introduce something where it pr produces more work to the clients, to the end user, uh, they will be reluctant to be using it. So what we are doing is you can use Shepas from within your existing systems that I previously said. So mm -hmm. what, what you would do is you would simply be able to send files because Sherpas does support sending files. You can encrypt those files and send them as a Sherpas link to your clients. There is also an option where you can actually request confidential information. Uh, we call it uh, the envelope mode. So I can send you a link uh, no matter where you are. You don't need to have Sherpas. And that's the whole beauty in the platform. Uh, as a sender, you will use Sherpas, but as a receiver, you don't have to, uh, you would just be able to use it as is because it will be end of the day, just a link available for you online. Uh, so that's supported across all platforms. You don't need to have it. You don't need to have it installed. And that's what makes it simple. Uh, so the onboarding process is very simple. Uh, so what happens? We have the uh, envelope mode where I can send you the link. There is nothing in that link. You would uh, click on it. It will essentially open the frame. And then you can put your file in there. And the moment you press OK, it comes back encrypted to me. Uh, and that's very helpful, uh, we found, because a lot of times <clears throat> you need to get in confidential information from clients. And then when you request it, what they normally do is they send it over email. And again, you don't want it over email. So then you need to delete the email. You need to ask them to delete the email. And it's just it's very hard to manage. And at some point you will forget. So what you can do is you can use this envelope. You would receive that confidential file. And after you receive that, that link is no longer accessible and available. And that really depends on any parameters that you put in as a, as the sender. Um, there is another example where HR departments uh, use that. And we've already worked with a few. Um, in many cases, when you onboard employees, um, you sometimes onboard multiple uh, that start in on next week and the IT department then gets the request to create them users, to create them an access, to create them all sorts of credentials. And then what happens is they would release sometimes those credentials um, the same time they create them and the employee only starts next week. So it leaves like a window, a gap where they potentially might have an access to systems, but they're not supposed to because they haven't even started yet. What you can do with Sherpas, you can actually schedule links. I can send you a link and say, all right, this link will be available for you next month. And until next month, there is nothing you can do to open it. And that really creates the kind of comfortable platform for HR slash IT, because there is usually a conflict there because HR requests access on this date. 
IT go ahead and say, all right, look, they all starting roughly the same time. Let's just create it in bulk and send it before the weekend. And that really sorts out this challenge because you granularly control the access level and you control uh, the access time. And you can also revoke that. So let's say an employee, potential employee changed their mind over the weekend. Oh, we're not coming on board. You can revoke that link if they haven't opened it yet. And you can clearly see if they open it or not. What utilities do you guys have in order to, let's say, log the use of that as well as to monitor that? If I'm a, if I'm a, a cybersecurity director or let's say a privacy director or so for that, we, we have to generate metrics and stuff all the time uh, for that for reporting purposes. Uh, can you tell me how SharePass is able to do that and provide that capability to an organization? Yeah. So SharePass has a web portal uh, where it's basically your administration portal. So you can see all of your secrets and, and secret we're saying is any transmission you have done, we call it a secret. So where you can see all of your secrets, all your transmissions, and you can see the access logs. And the access logs will provide you when something was accessed, was the access granted or not, what time, what date, IP address. It will provide you which browser it was accessed from, which device, and so forth. So you can really quickly analyze what sort of information you sent, where you sent it to, and was it opened or not? So when I'm sending you, for example, something like like a password right now, the moment you open it, I will get notification on my mobile that I actually opened it. So I'll be able to, so I have more control over the information that I send. And again, there are there is administration portal where you, when, where administrator can uh, manage uh, policies enroll security keys, uh, which is like an extra layer of, layer of security that we support, and really control in granular mode uh, the, all the security settings in SharePass for your organization. Over the years, when you look at some of the, the use cases that you guys are running into the most, uh, I would say my most complex use case usually is when we run into an organization that's going through an acquisition or a merger and acquisition. So you got two or three large companies that have a bunch of holding companies that share amongst them a lot of multiple HR systems or multiple client systems and stuff from that. And as they try to consume one another in order to create one entity or one company, usually the complexities come down to cyber, privacy, and national border type laws and stuff too that go along with that. And to, to my users, this product is built, maintained and stuff in Australia. And I just like to tell you from experience of working both with US uh, laws as well as Australian, sharing data and the rigor of policies and procedures there are just a little bit more rigorous than what we have here in the US. This is coming out of an area that has rigor within that area that has also a lot of parity with our NIST environment that we run in and our ISO environment. And they actually have their own as well. That's an Australian specific standard as well. Yeah. As yeah. far as I'm going to do cybersecurity, so I will tell you that there probably is some reciprocity to be had as well. If you're worried about things like, hey, can we use this in the U.S. or not? Yes, you can. <laughs> It'll meet a lot of the, ma the major the major standards and stuff that we have here, as well as being able to report. So just to get that out of the way. Yeah, we already have presence in a uh, in number of uh, places. So we work in Australia. We work already in uh, Singapore. We work with a very high level uh, cybersecurity college in uh, Singapore. Uh, we work with a couple of clients in the uh, US as well. One of them is a cybersecurity company that uses that solution to share confidential data with their clients. But they, the majority of the use case for them is they're using it actually to pull confidential data from their clients mm -hmm. because they constantly request for them to send confidential data to start the pen test. And then the clients go ahead and send it over email, which on its own, like you're looking to achieve a target, which is security. And yep. by the time you get there, you give up on some of your security. So it doesn't make sense. No. Um, so the whole transmission, we always need to make sure that the whole transmission is, is the part that we need to be the most careful about. Because once mission is done, we need to then go backwards and say, all right, how did I achieve the mission? How did I actually share all the data? And if by achieving the mission, you shared all, you shared all the data in a non-secure way, you really haven't achieved anything. You just created more problems. And that's, and that's really what happens today because we give up on our security for the sake of user friendliness. So we're looking for convenience, but for that convenience, we pay in cybersecurity risk. So what we, are, what we want to do is we want to say, okay, look, you want to share confidential data over SMS, go ahead. 
but just encrypted in SharePass. It will only cost you another click if you have the mobile app. And then you encrypted the information and then you said that the information was consumed. You don't have to worry about it anymore because that link is no longer available. You can set it up for multiple K for multiple uses. You can set it up, for example, for it to expire in eight hours and then it will simply expire. And you don't need to constantly worry about, oh, I need to go and clean up to myself. Like if we're talking about that subject and that's really what we're trying to achieve. And we're trying to achieve it in the most easy and user-friendly way, because again, it must be simple. Uh, our idea is to create here some security, but maintain simplicity, because if it's not going to be simple, many users are not going to be using it. And that's one of the challenges in cybersecurity today is all the solutions are aimed for the professionals. But when it comes down and drills down to the simple, typical user in the company, not many of them really aware and care about cybersecurity. They all know they should, but not necessarily all do that because that would normally require some extra process, some extra work, some extra mouse clicks and some extra level of complexity that not everybody wants. Sometimes I just want to send something confidential to you and I want to do it fast. I don't want to start, oh, listen, you need to install that. I need to install this. We need to then connect on that platform and only then I can send it to you. And then, okay, by that time, I'll just SMS it to you. And that's what happens. So we want to really create here something which is simple for the users to use so they can use it, not worry about all the onboarding process. And while they're doing that, protect themselves and their personal confidential information. I guess one of the industries that I look at where I always am, am nervous about, right? And that is, for instance, in things like lending in the U.S., Lending is a big area there for both consumer and businesses. That's where we probably put down the most amount of personal information and stuff there uh, for an organization to go through and dig through and then make a, make a decision on whether they want to lend to you or not. Are you finding that's an area or so that you guys are starting to see some, see some traction in or how is that, uh, how is that for you guys? So definitely, yes, uh, those organizations, they collect a lot of your confidential information. We have one challenge at the moment because they, for Sherpas to be effective in that case, uh, they need to comply with the policies. So it needs to come from their side in the way they collect the information. And that's essentially comes from compliance. Uh, and that's the beauty of compliance and forces companies to use data collection processes in a certain way. And if Look, you, I can provide that information in the SharePass links on the form, but it's not going to be accepted on their end. So mm -hmm. it's really the responsibility is on those companies who collect the PR personal identifiable information and, and protect it. Because what happens today, and that kind of uh, bothers me and I'm sure many other users, especially in Australia, for example, in the last couple of years, a lot of data breaches. And, and what happens in the majority of cases is that data is sits non, not encrypted at rest and then what happens if there is a breach that data is leaked um, and it's my data right so i provided my data to a third-party company they had a breach who is the one uh, taking the fall me as a user a bit of a problem there so if they theoretically would be storing that as encrypted links then not only in case of a breach data is not discoverable which is what we want to do right because you cannot prevent all breaches uh, let's be realistic. End of the day, it's a very tough war where hackers are getting more sophisticated. Cybersecurity gets also more sophisticated, but the level is keep on going up. So breaches are always potential. And I think companies need to accept the fact that breach may occur. It's not, it's less about, okay, how do we prevent every breach? Uh, mm -hmm. I don't think it's possible. Uh, like it's very hard to protect. It's easier to attack by the way than to protect. So the window of opportunity there is much larger. So I think the focus should shift to how do we prevent data leaks? Because end of the day, it's not about, okay, how do we prevent the breach? It's a, what is the problem with the breach is normally a loss of data. So we're really trying to protect the data here. So even in the case of a breach, you want that data to remain confidential. You want that data to remain inaccessible. And that's what SharePass can provide. Yeah. The steps that we take um here let's say as individuals are, are are pretty i would say it's pretty shallow and very short 
of what would be ideal. And, and I'm not saying trying to get to perfect. Just over the last couple of days here, there's individuals, in, in particular seniors in our area here, elderly uh, folks who on a daily basis are being approached by plenty of folks, some legit and some not legit, in order to get access to their data. Uh, most of the time, these transfers of data do happen over email. Mm -hmm. They do happen over email. And then also they're being given to third parties and stuff too from that. Now, not to say that they should insure data because we have to in order to do insurance, in order to do a lot of your daily life. Now you do have to give up some of that data because people, everybody wants to verify who you are. Yeah. Um, yeah. And with that being the case, individually, how can SharePass help the individual do a better job as far as on how they say to an organization, hey, here's how I'll provide you access to my information. How can SharePass help in that area for them? So SharePass, if you're that individual that uh, essentially gives away information, you obviously, number one, you always shouldn't provide information unless you know who you're provided to. If you have any suspicion into if whoever you provide information to is genuine or not, do not provide it. That's like the golden rule, right? I, I don't think there is a magic in that case with anyone because identification is a complicated process in the digital age. Um, and be because you need to have a way to identify the other party. Uh, and there are multiple ways to do it. And uh, there are multiple ways to create the trust. But you number one tool is use the common sense. After that, after you establish the common sense, you receive, for example, something that it's a bank requiring certain information. You should always question that. What information does it require? Why do they require that? If you're not sure it's really the bank, call them. Hey guys, I received this and that. Oh, yeah, that will take extra amount of time, but it is what it is. And you cannot really be reluctant about it because you never know. Because let's say a bank requests my information. I'm sending them a share pass link. It's hard for me to establish who is that? Because it's a bank, right? It could be any employee from that bank. So that employee tells me is John Miller. Mm -hmm. Do I have a real way to check that's John Miller? No, I never met him. I don't even know who he is. Um, so the best you can do is number one, use common sense. And number two, after you establish some level of trust, you can then share, like share, share pass link. Now, if you want to the user to verify himself, you can use second factor as a pin code because we support pin codes. So you can send it via other channel, other, other media pin code that they need to input to open that SharePass link. That's one option. If we're talking more on the organizational level, like say in using SharePass inside the organization, we support the uh, YubiKeys, which is security keys, yeah. where, you, where you can hand to your different users. And then with that key, you can verify your identity. So I can send you a SharePass link and you need to tap that key on your phone or insert it into your USB port on the computer, and only then the, the link will actually open for you. If we're taking it one step further, we support YubiKeys with fingerprints as well. So not only you need to insert the YubiKey, but you also need to authenticate yourself with a fingerprint. And only then you can open the secure package. Uh, so that might be a file. For example, if we, me and you work in the same company, and I'm sending you something really confidential, I would normally, the best way to do it, uh, from what we have at the moment is just verified with some level of uh, security key, NFC, biometrics, um, face recognition, which we are working on now, any one of those. So MFA is still a crucial part of verification. When you guys look at the overall, let's say advanced, and when I'm looking at right now, AI, and in particular for us, it's really been looking at what does quantum AI bring for the future when we talk about security when we talk about securing things either for confidentiality or even an in integrity of some of the communications and stuff that are there what do you guys see as the future for you guys as we start bringing in this more digital age and then also the area where you have you know acceleration of the speed of doing things with ai and machine learning how are you guys responding to that so AI and machine learning is a very close subject to us because we have ai uh, capabilities that we already using and integrating into SharePass. Uh, we working closely with uh, NVIDIA uh, and we implement uh, different modules in SharePass. And one of them being uh, essentially confidential data recognition. So we have uh, our mobile SharePass app that 
will recognize confidential data that you type in because one of the problems today is users when they're sharing information not everybody know exactly what confidential means people have different understanding of confidential someone mm -hmm. might say all right uh, my address is not confidential i think address is very confidential mm -hmm. somebody else might think okay hey, giving away an invoice number is not confidential i think it might be confidential so it really depends on the on the organization and what they define so in Shepas, we developed a module uh, called call inspector and what it does it, it, it essentially scans in real time what you're typing and if it identifies something that looks confidential like some form of a password address phone number and one of those details it will offer to you to actually encrypt that information before you send so by that preventing any potential data leak so removes that element of another element of responsibility from the user by alerting the user that, look, you're about to send here something confidential. Do you want to review that and encrypt it? Maybe that's what's required. And those policies can be set by those companies who essentially use in Shepas. In general, AI and machine learning is a very big subject. I think the cybersecurity landscape will improve because of that on one hand. On the other hand, like any other thing, it can be used for bad. Obviously, sophisticated phishing emails will become the norm. So today you can identify phishing by just reading that and you just see it's not genuine. With ChatGPT, with AI, with all of those tools, it's really easy to write a formal email today with no mistakes, with no problems. And that email, it looks way more genuine and you can write different versions and different uh, wordings and it's just an, an easier process easier than ever before yeah. um, but at the same time if it's implemented for example uh, in the different cybersecurity tools um, then it will also provide better protection because one of the problems uh, today is when you monitor security it's quite it's quite a manual element and as long as it's manual there will be problems there because it's very tedious it's very repetitive and in essence, again, I don't want to insult anyone, but it's boring. Like going over logs, it's boring. Yep. No one wants to do it, at least for a long time. And if we can leverage AI and machine learning to at least get the essence of those logs and get the alerts and translate them better so we don't have to do that manual work, then by all means, we're going to improve our cybersecurity. So it will both create new challenges, but at the same time, it will give a lot of new solutions, which actually save us a lot of work. We see it in our own solution. Like I said, we can already detect, predict the confidential data, which does half of the complicated work because not everybody necessarily always aware what they send and if it's confidential. No, I, I like the fact where you can, where you can have that suggestion. I would say that's probably been an improvement even amongst our company where, where our platforms are giving suggestions of, Hey, this might be confidential or well, you're sending this out. It could be uh, a confidential and classified information for us, or Hey, you've got personal information in here. Do you really want to send this and stuff there? I think the prompting and stuff does help and, uh, unless it gets a little too excessive and then you just start skipping it yeah. <laughs> the users. But at the end, that's still the other part. If you're able to alter the user behavior on that i think that's one of the keys to any cyber program or any privacy program actually being effective and stuff for that so that is that's very neat and unique and stuff too to be able to have that and definitely love to see where that where that continues to grow for you guys yeah i think it's i think it becomes very useful if you have those suggestions and things because it's you remember how we used to type on keyboards and now you have the autocomplete like without it it's almost impossible these days for me i'm just <laughs> typing yeah. and it it already knows uh, roughly what i'm typing uh, yep. Which, uh, look, I, I, I'm a little bit worried also there about the privacy part, uh, uh, but at, at the same time, uh, we always need to find the right balance between uh, privacy and convenience. Mm -hmm. uh, so we always need to check how those systems work and in what way they perform. Uh, and again, I think AI is in the very early stages because what we have today and um, that's at least my opinion. It's more of a very sophisticated machine learning. Yes. We, are not, we are not in the age of AI. Uh, yep. I think we will potentially, we will eventually get there. But at the moment we, we rely on big piles of data, which is machine learning. And mm -hmm. it, it basically then produces some other data based on those. 
So it's an early stage. It's amazing, uh, no doubt. I think we are more talking about machine learning right now than full-blown AI. Uh, no. I'm sure it's coming, but we are no. still not quite there. Uh, no, I totally agree. I uh, totally agree with you on that. Yeah, right now I say that we're training. We're yeah. currently training, right? We're with training. Training, yeah. infer inferences and stuff from a machine learning standpoint, and then training uh, AI engines at this point, and as well as adapting what's going on from an algorithm standpoint when it comes to that. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It, it, it is. We're in that phase. And it, it's so funny because we have just a couple of big public trainings when we talk about chat gpt and other <laughs> areas there where we're just training helping the train at this point data is being collected data is being parsed data is being extracted and inferences are being made so that's that's where we are right now yeah and look it's it's pretty amazing technology i think it will uh, help a lot it might create challenges but it will also definitely create a lot of solutions mm -hmm. i've seen the work being done from up close and it's amazing what you can do today with that technology if you use it the correct way so I'm generally welcoming it, right? It will happen sooner or later. It's just important to implement it the right way and to be very careful about what sort of information you provide and release before you release it. And, and that's the general behavior today online. Always before you share and before you put some information, just provide what you've been requested. Don't feel uh, the need to overdo it. If you've been requested certain information, provide it. Make sure that you trust the party you provided to, but we need to be very careful with the information we provide these days. Yep, absolutely. And that's both for our, our protection from a personal standpoint, and then also protecting our organizations, clients, and customers. You can see it every day as far as on, to your point, 100%, you're probably going to have a breach of some sort. 100%, you're probably going to be compromised in some way both individually as well as corporately. Even us, as far as, you know, we, I practice in the field, right? Our company before has been hit with different things as well, but with that we learn and we adapt and we continue to look at how we can improve and stuff on that. But just knowing that there's, there are forces out there that are also continuing to adapt and improve on how they actually do, how they actually attack us as well as continue to provide data breaches and stuff for us in this area. So that's where we are, guys. It's continuing to look at how we, and work with a solution providers like SharePass, taking in some of the things that they are, are working with in their solutions and how we can apply that in our daily lives or with even in our corporate you know, environments there. Looking for that access and looking to continue to improve in that area there. So uh, I just want to thank Yuri for coming on today. This is, again, this is the first part to a two-part series here. So you guys can join us again and we'll get a little bit deeper as far as in uh, sharing some more of our perspectives as far as in cyber. Uh, also, in looking at how uh, Yuri's perspectives and his teams and stuff too are helping to frame share past two here for the future. So, thank you for your time today. I appreciate it, Yuri. Uh, thank you very much. It's great to be here. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, Max. That's all for this episode of The Lojo Show. If you want to see updates on the show, its upcoming guests, and more, follow our LinkedIn or our new Twitter page. If you have questions for Lojo or want to come on the show, you can send us an email at officiallojoshow at gmail.com or join our new Discord server. You have to follow our LinkedIn page to learn how to join. With that, we will say goodbye, have a great week, stay safe, and stay secure.